Welcome back. In this session, I'd like to turn my attention to something that happened three days ago in the U.S. markets. If you've been tracking the U.S. market for the last 10 weeks, markets have been up and down, and it's not just the U.S., it's globally. And as markets have gyrated, experts and gurus have tried to explain what's going on, often coming up with explanations that morph and change by the day. On December 4th, which was Tuesday, they came up with a new explanation. It was a day that the market was down 800 points. And while there were many things they could point to, one of the triggers that, that experts claimed drove the market down was the fact that a portion of the yield curve inverted. You see, what are you talking about? The yield curve captures interest rates for different maturities. I mean, usually it's done with the U.S. Treasury, but it can be done with any entity that has a fixed amount of risk. So when the yield curve inverts, longer term rates actually drop below shorter term rates. Now note, on December 4th, the entire yield curve did not invert, a portion of it, the five-year rate, the five-year U.S. Treasury rate was lower than the three-year rate. And that triggered a whole lot of angst, with many predicting that this was going to, uh, th this was a predictor of a recession. Now to understand this reasoning, let's start off by looking at yield curves over time. In this graph, I looked at the yield curve at the start of every year, starting in 2009, going through 2018. And as you can see, this, these are the 10 years after the crisis. The yield curve right after the crisis was steeply upward sloping, and it remained upward sloping for the bulk of this period. But especially in the last two years, it's flattened out. And by the time you get to 2018, it's much flatter than it's been at any time in the last decade. And on December 4th of 2018, the day that you had this kerfuffle in the market, and I like that word, James McIntosh used it to describe what happened, was if you look at the yield curve on December 4th, you notice that the five-year rate was lower than either the two or the three-year rate. So it's not even that the entire yield curve had inverted, but a portion of it had inverted. Now you might say, so what? Let's step back and think about what it is that causes yield curves, curves to be upward sloping most of the time. Over the last century, 90% of the time, the yield curve in the U.S. has been upward sloping. And there's a simple way to explain it. If you think about interest rates as the sum of two numbers, expected inflation plus an expected real interest rate, you take out default risk, and that's what you get with the U.S. Treasury, in a mature market where expectations of inflation are pretty stable over time, and your short term, your expectations of inflation in the short term are pretty close to what they are in the long term, here's what you should expect to see. The expected inflation will be pretty much the same across the yield curve. But for investors to buy longer term bonds, you have to offer them a premium. It's called a maturity premium, and it's been around a long time. In fact, you can trace it back to economists 100 years ago, 200 years ago, arguing that to get investors to buy bonds with longer maturity, you have to offer them a, bigger, a higher real interest rate. That maturity premium will therefore mean that in most time periods, most in mature markets, yield curves will be upward sloping. But sometimes, even in markets like the US, the yield curve becomes downward sloping. To understand why this might have a link to economic growth, let's think about the mechanics of how a yield curve inverts. Remember, there are two components of the yield curve. There's the short term and the long term. And for inversion to happen, either the long term rate has to collapse, the short term rate has to shoot up. At least in the US, the mechanics of yield curves inverting has been almost always the short-term rate rising significantly rather than the long-term rate dropping off. Now you're saying, big deal, what does that even mean? And in the US, short-term rates generally start to get pushed up significantly when the Fed hits the brakes on monetary policy. Why might it do it? Because it sees signs of higher inflation or an overheated economy and the Fed hits the brakes. In fact, to show you how much Yield, inversion of the yield curves have been driven by Fed action. In this graph, I've graphed out the, the yield curve, but I've also graphed out, uh, graphed out the Fed funds rate, which is the primary mechanism that the Fed has to show how restrictive or easy its monetary policy is. So when Fed funds rates decrease, you're going towards an easier monetary policy. When Fed funds rates increase, you're tightening up money policy. And if you look across time, you can see that almost every episode where yield curve inversions occur, where short-term rates rise dramatically, it's been the, it, they're accompanied by Fed funds rates going up. Now, in the U.S. at least then, inverted yield curves reflect the fact that there's a Fed effect. 
Now, let's connect this to economic growth. To the extent that you believe that the Fed does affect economic growth, that the Fed, by tightening or loosening monetary policy, can affect economic growth, you're seeing the inverted yield curve become a proxy for a Fed effect. If you truly believe that the Fed can affect the economy by easing or, or tightening monetary policy, then an inverted yield curve is a sign that economic growth is going to drop off in the future because the Fed's tightened up and you should expect to see that, that connection. Of course, these are a bunch of hypotheses. Let's see if they hold up. The Fed, uh, this is actually from a study from the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of, Saint, uh, of San Francisco, which where they looked at, you know, 60 years, 65 years of history. And they looked at inverted yield curves in economic growth. And this is kind of scary. Over this period, an inverted yield curve has been an almost perfect predictor of a recession. Every time yield curves invet, have inverted, recessions have fallen, except for one episode in 1965, across this time period, you can see that inverted yield curves have predicted recessions. That's kind of scary, right? Because you're saying, well, if December 4th was the start of an inverted yield curve, does this mean we're going to recession? Well, perhaps, but I think we need to dig a little deeper. And what does that mean? Well, remember, when we talk about inverted yield curves, we're acting as if this is a zero-one game, whether the yield curve is inverted or not inverted. But the reality is the slope of the yield curve is a continuous number. Yield curve can be more upwardsly slope or less upwardly slope. And similarly, classifying the economy as into a recession or a, or a growth economy is, again, missing the fact that economic growth can fall in a continuum. So to see if, in fact, the slope of the yield curve and economic growth are connected, I started by looking at U.S. Treasury rates over time in this graph. And you can see the 1970s where interest rates spiked, and then you go to the post-2008 time period and you have low interest rates. But this is, you know, 10-year rates, 5-year rates, 3-year rates, 2-year rates, 1-year rates, 3-month, they're all, they all, for the most part, tend to move together. Then I zeroed in on five measures of the yield spread. One was the difference between the one year and the three month rate. So it's at the short end of the, the yield. The, and then I have the two versus the one, the five versus the two. Think of that as a medium term. And then I have the 10 year rate compared to both the three month rate and a two year rate. So I've got measures of the yield spreads for both the short end of the, of the, of the, yields, uh, of the yield curve spectrum and the long end. Now, as you can see, most of the time, these spreads move together. When one increases, the other tends to increase. So for the most part, yield spreads move together. So at this point, you're saying, well, what does that even tell me? I wanted to see whether these yield spreads would be good predictors of economic growth. So here's what I did. I superimposed real GDP growth each quarter and for the following year on this graph. So if you look at this graph, you can see the both the, the and so this is the quarter after you observe the year, because you need to have, a, if it's a predictive instrument, you should be able to predict what will happen to GDP in the next quarter of the next year. So if you look at this graph, you can see that I've graphed both the yield spread and GDP growth in the next quarter and the next year on the same graph. Now, it's really tough to look at a graph and back out, but you can see, broadly speaking, the, the basis for the Fed's chart, right, which is every time the yield spread has become negative, economic growth has dropped off and often turned negative. So there seems to be some basis for the, but if you look at the periods where yield spreads are positive, the link to GDP growth turns, starts to become a lot hazier. So here's what I did. I decided to look at the correlation between the the size of the, yield, the the slope of the yield curve by measured as the difference between the 10 year rate and the two year rate or the two year rate and the one year rate and GDP growth in the next quarter and the next year. So here's a way to read this, this table. First, if as yield spreads decrease and become negative, economic growth is also getting lower or more negative, the correlation should be positive. So the basic hypothesis of inverted yield curves predicting recession should lead to a positive correlation. And the strength of the relationship should be measured by how close the correlation is to plus one. So take a look at that this table because it kind of illustrates both the strengths and weaknesses of the yield spread as a predictor. In fact, I've broken down the correlations into two time periods, one over the entire time period, 1962 through 2018, and the second looking at the post-crisis, 2008 through 2018 time period. Now, here's what I see in this table, and you can stay on this table if you want as I look at the three things that I see. The first is, if you look at the table, you can see that it's even 
in if you look if you're looking for positive correlations, it's the short end of the spectrum, not the long end that predicts economic growth. In other words, it's a difference between the one year and the and the three month, and the two year and the one year. In fact, the two year versus the one year is the best. It has the strongest relationship here. It, so when that spread is is more positive, economic growth tends to be higher. When that spread is more negative or, or, or lower, economic growth also tends to be lower. So it's a short end of the spectrum of the yield curve that seems to have predictive power, not the long end. And the reason I emphasize that is most people, when they, th when they try to come up with a metric to measure the yield curve, look at the difference between their 10-year and the two-year rate. And the 10-year versus the two-year rate actually does not have any, in fact, it has when that number it has negative predictive power, the correlation, if you look at it, is actually is actually slightly negative. It's close to zero. So the co there's almost no correlation. Even with the with the portion of the yield spread that have predictive power, some some humility is needed because it, it's not the correlation is not one. I think the highest number there is accounts for about twenty nine percent of GDP growth. So looking at the two year versus the one year, which is the strongest predictor, you predict about 29%. Another way of thinking about it is you don't predict 71% of what's going on. And the post 2008 time period suggests that we might need even more caution in reading the yield curve. If you look at the correlations post 2008, the numbers have actually reversed. Even the short end of the spectrum, which used to predict economic growth, now you get negative correlations or zero correlations. Something clearly did happen in 2008 that might lead you to believe that there's been a structural break. You might argue that this is just um, you know, coming out of the crisis. You've had all these, these strange years. Maybe it's not just strange years. Maybe this is a shift in, in, in the model that you need to build into your predictions. Now, of course, all of this is built around economic growth. And if you're an investor, your focus is less on the economy and more on stock prices. Put differently, you want to know whether an inverted yield curve predicts what will happen to stock returns in the next quarter in the next year, not what will happen to the economy. So to answer this question, I looked at yield, sp yield sp uh, curve spreads versus stock returns, just like I did versus GDP growth. But here I looked at stock returns in the following quarter and the following year. And again, it's really tough to read anything in this graph. I mean, you might be a better chart reader than me, but looking at this graph, I just see you know, spiky lines all over. So basically, I looked at the correlations just like I did for GDP growth. Again, remember, if the slope of the yield curve is a good predictor of stock returns in the future, then you should see positive correlations. And the stronger the relationship, the closer to one you should get. Already, you can see that if there's a relationship here, it's on the short end of the spectrum, just like we found for GDP growth. And it's far weaker than it was for GDP growth. Even my strongest predictor here, which is the one year versus three month, has an, an R squared of only 19% or a correlation of only 19%. And again, 2008 seems to break the process because the numbers all start to shift and you actually start to get negative correlations. Post 2008, a flatter yield curve has been associated with better stock returns, whereas pre 2008, the reverse was true. What do I read out of this? I think that as I look at these graphs, I, I think we're making two mistakes here. The first is um, that we're reading too much into a blip on a day. December 4th was one day and we didn't get an inverted yield curve. We got a portion of the yield curve inverted. It's amazing how many stories are being told about it. I think we're reading too much into a predictor that's already a noisy predictor. The second mistake I think we're making is we're still acting like it's the 1990s and the 1980s. In my view, 2008 changed the global economic structure in a way that many rules of thumb that used to work pre-2008 will no longer work. I'm not suggesting yet that an inverted yield curve is one of those metrics that will stop working, but I would not have as much faith as many people seem to have in it being a surefire way of predicting that there'll be a recession next year. So what's the bottom line? I think overall, the flattening of the yield curve in the last two years is more good news than bad news. That the extraordinarily upward sloping yield curves you saw post 2008 were a sign of, an, of a sick economy, not a healthy economy. So I think the flattening out is more good news than bad news because it suggests that economic growth is coming back, that inflation is starting to revert back to normal levels. That said, though, the fact that the 10 year bond rate, the 10 year US Treasury bond rate is kind of doesn't seem to want to go through 3% is, I think, sobering. It's sobering because it suggests that investors are not 
as optimistic about future growth as some macroeconomists might be, as the as as as, uh, as some people predicted that the economy would do, that perhaps um, without a tailwind of a of a tax cut, that what you're seeing in the yield curve is a signal that economic growth is not might not even if it doesn't get negative will level off that you're going to see a kind of coming back to earth of the US economy for stocks the key test then will be as the economy starts growing at a slower rate will they be able to sustain the earnings growth they've been able to show for the past few years and that'll be an interesting test because i think um, again without a tax cut benefit we'll have to see if the, if the earnings growth rate drops off significantly in the year to come and, and the other is, it'll be also interesting to see if as the economy slows, whether companies will continue to return as much cash as they have historically, because that's been one of the pillars that's held up the stock market. So there's a lot of unknowns here. And for the moment, at least, I'm holding my fire. But, uh, but I think that we need, as a general rule, I think we need to take these rules of thumb we've developed over the last century and put them back under the microscope. Because I think the world has changed under us. Thank you very much for listening.